Our first speaker today comes from Applied Materials, um, Nag uh, Patibandla. I got it right. I've been working so hard in my night. Uh, he's currently the Vice President of Advanced Deposition Products in the Office of the CTO at Applied Materials. Um, he's got a number of emerging technology uh, and funded programs. Certainly excited about the CHIPS Act, I'm sure, co coming up. And uh, his activities are related to micro LED displays, three nitride devices, superconducting materials that you'll hear more about as well later on uh, during the Brumley Pritchett lecture, 3D printing, a host, host of things. It's all outlined here. I encourage you to review that. Nog, please share this uh, wonderful materials with us. We've got both a lavalier mic as well as this. Oh, Okay, great, thank you. Okay. Get these instruments paired up. Does it have a mouse or no? Uh, it was on that. Might be easier just to use the keyboard. Oh, okay, okay. Page down. Okay, great. Okay, it gives me a great pleasure to be here. <clears throat> Thank you for inviting me, Eric, Jack, and Ray. Um, happy to be here. Um, this is an exciting time for most of us in the materials engineering area. Um, materials engineering is always exciting. So uh, um, at Applied, we do hire a lot of people in engineering disciplines, and the two favorite disciplines we had people in in the uh, sciences area is applied physics and chemists. And uh, we always tell those uh, science graduates that the best physicists are those that turn themselves into electrical engineers, and best chemists are those that turn themselves into materials engineers. So otherwise, we don't have much use for them if they want to remain as physicists and uh, chemists. But in any case, um, um, I've been at applied for about 13, 14 years now. I've been working in the um, uh, R&D area, research area, for about a decade. Um, I have been responsible for a few uh, new areas of innovation. So the group I'm in, we are worrying about uh, what we call non-core areas. So certainly we do a lot of semiconductor and display-related businesses, or uh, areas R&D. Uh, problem solving for existing customers, but the more importantly, taking those competencies that we have and applying it to the new areas. And so today I'm going to mostly focus on the uh, AR, VR devices, the next computation, and some people in the Silicon Valley are betting high on it. There's one guy betting so high that he changed his company's name so, <laughs> to Metaverse. So we'll see, you know, how um, things evolve. So certainly people do all sorts of uh, interesting things in the, that, that part of the world. Um, so I'll give a brief introduction to Applied, and then we'll look at uh, two key uh, elements. So I'm going to be behind on the... Yeah, I'm trying to still figure this out. Maybe one of these buttons will work. No. Yeah, I can page down. Yeah, yeah. So um, Applied is a large company. Um, so founded in 1967 in a garage, like most uh, Silicon Valley companies are, uh, but long time ago. Uh, $23 billion revenue. Um, that is quite a bit higher compared to the last uh, few years. Um, the fiscal year that ended in October of last year, the revenue did go up, um, and largely due to everything you hear about chip um, chip shortage. And there is quite a bit of that still going on, and we'll see where that leads us. Um, so we do spend quite a bit of money on our R&D. So any? Oh, okay. This one works. Oh, okay, okay, great, thank you. Yeah, so we do quite a bit of we do spend quite a bit of money in R and D. Um, we have fifteen thousand seven hundred patents 
that almost represents a patent issue to applied on every working day in its uh, existence. Um, we employ 27,000 people, that's the uh, full-time equivalents, not counting contractors and other consultants and other people that we have. Um, more importantly, we expect to be hiring pretty close to 20,000 more in the next five years. So there is a lot of opportunity for those of you looking for work in the semiconductors area. It's a great, great company to consider, and I highly recommend it because I'm there. <laughs> so um, what do we do? Um, you know, <clears throat> I was walking by the um, fab, that small fab that you have here. A lot of the tools, they're just like the tools that we have in any of our R&D buildings, um, a little larger. So if you look at the uh, our display equipment, they tend to be even much larger. The largest of the one that we sell in the display area is roughly fits into a soccer field. So they tend to be pretty large equipment. That's simply because there they are trying to process substrates that are about the size of a two-car garage door. And so, and they want to do hundreds of them per hour. So it's it's a quite a bit of a challenge in respect to you know how you move that substrate. But most of the semiconductor equipment we sell, they run on 300 millimeter silicon wafer. Silicon CMOS is bread and butter to our products. Um, we like to think of ourselves as people that provide these uh, sophisticated manufacturing systems. When you look at our customer base that has consolidated quite a bit over the last three or four decades, and we only have like a handful of customers, but they represent 90%, pretty close to 90% of our revenues. But that's you know uh, likely not to change a whole lot because the investments needed to make a new fab are significant, you know, people are talking about spending, in order to build a new 300 millimeter advanced node fab, it costs anywhere between five to $10 billion. That is likely to go up with, with time. Um, what's driving our business? You know, this is one of our marketing people's slide. Um, so we look, at, we look at what happened in the semiconductor industry over a period of a few decades in 1980s, computation, uh, personal computer, um, and then we went into the smartphone and now the machine generated data and learning. And the next day, uh, era that we are looking at is mostly driven by IoT and big data, big data created by artificial intelligence and so on. We do expect this industry to reach to a trillion dollars by 2030. And this is the value of end semiconductor products that are made by our customers. So the segment we are in is called WFE, Wafer Fab Equipment. That's roughly about 80 to $100 billion today. And that's expected to grow to about roughly $200 billion range. So, um, so we, we are, you know, as I showed you, our revenue is 23 billion. So we are about 23 billion of the 80 billion or so. Um, we like to think of ourselves as not as an equipment provider, even though that's what we sell, that's what, uh, get the money for. Um, we like to think of ourselves as a materials engineering company. And the materials engineering we worry about is really creating at a very small nodal uh, dimensions. Seven nanometers is the current uh, manufacturing node. 11 is also considered to be advanced, but seven is certainly the mainstay. Um, we like to think of ourselves as people that create uh, these nanostructures, for example, in a square inch, uh, half, half, half inch square, uh, 20 miles. And I should have picked a better dimension to put between rather than Santa Cruz and Monterey, but that's in our, our, our neck of the woods. So creating 20 miles long nanoscale copper and the composition you know, in the phase, everything that goes on, and the electrical properties of this copper are very important, you know, in every millimeter of the 20 mile length. Um, modifying the top three atomic layers of the material, um, that's worrying about equivalent to a business card sitting on top of a skyscraper and how do you, you know, maintain the um, properties very uniformly all across the 300 millimeter wafer. Uh, that's something that we worry about. Um, etching is an area, uh, one area that Applied does not play a role in or does not have commercial products in 
is in the lithography area. That's uh, ASML uh, is the big market shareholder in that area. But once you imprint um, your your um, uh, design, removing the material, etching is uh, one of those areas that we have quite a bit of a presence in. You know, a trillion contact holes at a very high aspect ratio, one to forty, is uh, you know something we worry about. And analyzing, you know, the defects. Defects are killers. Small particles are killers. Um, and uh, worrying about uh, doing it very fast on a 300 millimeter wafer is also an area of expertise for applied. So um, again, that's what we think is our core competency. And when we are worrying about new areas of growth, new areas of R&D, that's what we are worrying about when we say, you know, where do, where can we take our competencies and where else can we apply? And so um, the kind of equipment we sell, sorry for small um, icons here, um, there are quite a few products, <laughs> as you can see. So uh, PVD, CVD, ALD, um, uh, uh, etching, wet clean, CMP, those are the kind of fab processes we sell equipment for. And these are typically range anywhere between uh, three to five million dollars to as big as ten million dollar products. So each equipment and tool. So we do sell quite a few of them to add up to 23 billion, as you can see. So, um, where 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 is our R and D uh, located? You know, a lot of R and D is done in Santa Clara, California. Certainly, that's the uh, main uh, made on technology center where we have a small fab. Um, we're also present in along at the Meta Center in New York, and we have a uh, advanced packaging development center in Singapore, and obviously with the Chips Act, uh, both have a specific areas of interest to create a national semiconductor technology center as well as a packaging institutes or packaging centers. So we are in active conversations with a lot of people from Department of Commerce and NEST and trying to replicate some of our facilities. Um, certainly they can't create a fab like what Intel has, but certainly they, uh, many of them came and visited us both in Singapore and uh, in Santa Clara and as well as our line in Albany trying to look at what we do, how we run the wafers. So certainly that would be a lot cheaper than, you know, running a full fab. Um, so our um, metrology group or process diagnostic group is in Israel, and that's where a lot of the metrology and ins inspection R&D is done. So uh, given that, you know, there is um, quite a bit of excitement in the uh, Bay Area, Silicon Valley, uh, about the next evolution of computation. Um, some of us that have been, maybe maybe this gives away my uh, conservative uh, approach and uh, my age, but we are worried about, you know, wearing and walking around with these glasses and so on. Uh, I didn't put the picture here, I actually took it out, even though one of my, uh, one of my guys uses it very actively. There's a picture where Mark Zuckerberg is running down in a big hallway Everybody around him, everybody sitting in the audience were wearing it, but he wasn't. So that picture tells you that, you know, I mean, there are certain things you can do while wearing it, certain things you can't do. So, um, but nevertheless, it's, it's one of those things for gaming and other things, people are beginning to use them. Uh, the general um, usage when it will happen is still uncertain, but still there is a lot of excitement in it. I thought this cartoon is kind of interesting. I won't read it, but anyway. Um, so what we need for this new evolution um, is quite a few subsystems. The electronics need to improve. Um, weight all of a sudden has become a big issue, weight of these subsystems and sub-elements. The volume of each of those subsystems and elements is a big issue. And the energy usage, power usage by these subsystems issue. Uh, the, the energy usage by computation is, has always been a big issue and evolving, but it was less so, um, you know, before the cell phones and other things, uh, wearables became issue with respect to battery usage, but um, it's going to become even more of an issue in this case. But the two areas that I'm going to focus on is the optics and the displays. 
Uh, optics, it's uh, close to home for us. You know, there is a lot of similarity. So what we do for electrons, can we do the same for our, our protons, you know, is the idea. Um, so we'll look into that and then uh, this place. We do have quite a few programs in the energy storage area. So we do uh, develop some advanced solutions for lithium ion battery. So I won't go into that and, you know, certainly you, know, you can read up quite a bit about our traditional microelectronics and uh, silicon CMOS area and advancements there. Um, a lot of it is published in, in the literature. So um, what do we need in the optics area? You know, the conventional optics are glass plates and lenses and so on. We all know, we all learn in the physics classes, convex and concave lenses and so on. They tend to be bulky, and what we need is a very simple, um, thin architecture, um, a device that can that has a ability to manipulate the photons. So phase amplitude and polarization becomes important at a system level or a module level. So you need to reduce the stack height or volume, uh, simplify the assembly, and simplify the mechanical integration to the rest of the system improve the alignment accuracy and um, uh, less bulky and much lighter weight. So given that, um, you know, we've been looking at flat optics, what we call flat optics and uh, wave guides are the two areas that we've been actively looking at. Traditional optics, as I mentioned, are based on refraction and reflection of light. The uh, elements are bulky. They are multiple, uh, a multiple of uh, wavelength of the light that they are manipulating. Um, whereas the distinguishing feature of the flat optics is the use of nanoscale ar arrays. And these are materials that need to be controlled, whose refractive index need to be controlled very close to what you want to design them for and very uniformly. And then um, they tend to be much smaller in the wavelength, um, the, the much smaller in dimension than the wavelength of light they are controlling. So, Given that the two areas that we are offering current products in is in the um, engineered optics area in IR lenses and waveguides, and I'll go a little bit deeper into each one of those and what we do and how we make them, but the uh, two structures that we do are those. So if you look at the similarities between the semiconductors and the uh, engineered optics, you know, growing and, you know, depositing layers and manipulating that material and removing it, and creating these nanostructures is very similar to what we do. And so currently um, we are in, um, uh, I wouldn't say high volume manufacturing, but in a reasonably good size manufacturing of these optical elements for companies that are uh, large companies that are in the, in the, in the business of making these, uh, you know, wearable devices. Um, for waveguides, uh, as you can see, it's the etched waveguide structure and it's a 300 millimeter wafer, um, greater than 2.0 uh, refractive index glass. And on the uh, flat optics, these are all the um, sensors that go onto your phone and that is sensing the IR. Um, and there are much better uses for it, or much more value added uses for it in the wearable uh, instrument. Um, so one of the things that we uh, worried about, and this is the reason why we have a very good size uh, business in this area uh, that developed over a period of uh, 20, 18 to 24 months actually very quickly, is we were able to come up with a thin and lightweight, highly transmittance glass uh, and be able to do a high refractive index grading and substrate uh, on it. So the kind of materials we use on it, I'll show you, but the key uh, high value problem we were able to address is, you know, both lightweight and large field of view using these gradings in the high refractive index class. So um, the kind of films we use is, you know, the traditional, traditional way of making it is using it as a spin-on material. So we were able to deposit this film at a very high uniformity. You know, that was the key. And obviously we were able to uh, etch it at an angle. The angular etching was also important for this particular uh, material. And, um, you know, using our traditional PVD um, techniques, physical vapor deposition techniques that we use in the semiconductor space, we were able to deposit these films and control the 
refractive index and other mechanical properties and electrical properties of these materials very close to what's needed. So um, that's the key enablement that we bring to the table. Um, so we not only do those two, but we also do quite a few of the other uh, optical devices in this uh, system. You know, distributed Bragg reflectors, uh, anti-reflection coatings and bandpass filters and beam splitters, as well as index matching layers, you know, various index matching layers. So again, this is a kind of an alphabet soup of, uh, you know, our capability, but that's, that's what we are worrying about in this area. And optics certainly is a very important area in this. And, uh, you know, if you look at just the Bragg reflector example, um, you know, the, the simplicity of this material is there are only two materials. You have to alternate layers of high refractive index and the low refractive index material. But um, one of the things that we were able to do is uh, what we call bring in an onboard metrology onto our PVD tools or spotter deposition tools where a layer of material is deposited and then immediately the material is, um, uh, the thickness uniformity is measured within the chamber. And then only we proceed to the next layer. So they can actually in situ measure the thickness of the material as well as the refractive index of the material. And if there is any compositional deviation, they actually uh, can remove the substrate from that point and see if they can rectify it. But 90% of the time they don't and they discard it. Um, so given that level of control, we're able to match, you know, the customer's requirements pretty well over an entire visible wavelength um, in manipulating the photons on that. So um, the, <clears throat> the smoothness of the surface of these layers is also a critical requirement. They do measure the surface roughness in this area. Um, similarly, in the anti-reflective coating area <clears throat> and the index matching area, so we can do uh, the in-situ metrology key properties that deposit the layers that we are looking for. Anyway, this is another example of how well we can control the properties. Um, and one other area in this uh, optical elements that is key is uh, grating pitch. So because these are at dimensions smaller than the wavelength of the light that they are trying to manipulate, a small deviation in the pitch can substantially affect the uniformity of your, uh, the picture and the image and everything else that's going on. And so, you know, we, we are beginning to worry about picometer length, uh, pitching and grading uniformities. And we are able to do that using our, uh, you know, techniques, some of the techniques that we developed in, in the etching area. Um, so that's another area. Um, yeah, again, the unique capabilities is uh, we, we can process a transparent substrate uh, 300 millimeter glass substrate, as well as we can do the silicon substrate. And uh, it might sound simple, but it is uh, quite a bit of a mechanical engineering because there's a lot of automated um, robotic movement of these wafers inside these tools, or especially when they go from tool to tool, or chamber to chamber to tool to tool. Um, so that depend on optical sensing. And so when you put in a glass substrate as opposed to a silicon substrate, things need to be changed from uh, you know, being able to use optical sensors to some other types of sensors. So that makes it very difficult. And so anyway, we were able to get around that. 300 millimeter substrates are being handled uh, routinely now. Uh, a lot of slanted structures, multifunction meta surfaces and you know, by engineered surfaces. And so, so we hope to grow this business quite significantly and we expect this business to grow quite significantly over the next few years. Um, that's on the optic side and the displays. Um, you know, there is a lot of excitement in the displays area too. Um, as many of you know, uh, traditional displays like the ones that we are at, not the projector ones, but the ones that we use uh, regular day to day, tend to be LCD, liquid crystal displays. And a lot of the, uh, a lot of, a lot of our phones, maybe not, but a lot of your kids' phones are likely to be more advanced or more, more recent. Uh, Apple iPhones, which have uh, OLED displays. Um, certainly there is nothing wrong with LCD and OLED, but uh, scaling them down to the dimensions that you're looking for, for the AR, VR, optical device-based uh, displays is very difficult. So I'll go into a little bit of details on why uh, that is the case. 
So people started to look at micro LEDs. Um, gallium nitride LEDs have done a fantastic job in the last few years uh, since uh, Nakamura invented the low temperature gallium nitride buffer. Um, and, and, and we uh, uh, have quite a few, uh, I, I actually went to Applied Materials to uh, funny story, but uh, I actually went to uh, Applied Materials in 2008 to develop and commercialize uh, MOCVD equipment to do gallium nitride and sapphire. That was the key project that attracted me to Applied. We spent um, pretty close to three years and about $300 million and said, nah, we, we, we can't compete in this space. We don't, we don't really have, well, we made a tool and, and to date, a lot of the guys that worked on that program still did apply. Um, we think we made the world's best MOCVD reactor. I think a decade later, it is still the world's best MOCVD reactor, but we priced it 5X the market bearing price at that time. And a lot of people are now coming back to us and asking for that tool because of the capability that had. And we were worrying about particles and we were worrying about silicon being able to process silicon substrate as opposed to sapphire substrates a decade too early. So, so sometimes in the industry, you know, worrying about the right product at the right time becomes critical. So, so you could be so far ahead of the market. But anyway, so micro LED, gallium nitride, and really making the gallium nitride LEDs so small that you can use it as an emitter inside each subpixel, you know, is that possible? And if that's possible, you know, where can this technology go? So that's the area that we are looking at. The, the key requirements for these displays is, um, you know, when you're looking at your phone indoors or looking at these screens, you're looking at them at about 300, at most 400, in the, in the very uh, high brightness, well-lit room, maybe 600 nits. That's the brightness you're looking them at. And uh, we'll show you, I'll show you an example where some of these AR, VR devices, uh, if you want to wear them outdoors, they might need almost a million nets. That's a very high brightness and you wouldn't want to look at it, I mean, uh, directly at them. Uh, but the optical elements, in spite of the great optical devices that I've shown, they are not very efficient. They, their overall light transmittance efficiency is about 1%. And that's state of the art right now. So we need to improve that. The uh, glass-based optical elements, they tend to be even worse than that, 0.1% range. Um, uh, anyway, so the resolution, because these, these displays are so close to your eye, the resolution needs to be 3,000 and 5,000 PPI range. And again, what you're looking at on your phone tends to be around 500 PPI. And so going from there to 3,000 PPI, that creates some of the challenges. So, so we'll look at some of these uh, technologies. Um, this is not an exhaustive list of all the uh, AR, VR devices that you can buy. Certainly there are a few that you can buy uh, that are not listed here. The reason I didn't list them here is none of them use a micro LED based display. These are the ones that are, gonna, that are announced are coming out are being developed using micro LED uh, display as an enabler. Um, and so there are two or three products that will become available here, but they will be single color. So the third requirement is uh, multicolor. You know, you want to look at something that has all three colors in it, uh, red, green, and blue. Uh, we call it the three primary colors, red, green, and blue, or uh, polychromic, which is the whole rainbow of uh, colors. Um, and then, so the key requirement is when are these bottom row products coming out and so on. Um, Cura, by the way, uh, won the best, best of the show, I believe, at the CES this year, uh, Cura Gallium yeah, so product. Um, so looking at, uh, this is not my slide, uh, but looking at the, um, uh, not my table, um, they're looking at the figure 70 from the credit suits report. <clears throat> so you look at it and you say, why does micro LED preferred? It's the response time and the brightness, the million nits that you need, uh, contrast ratio, um, and the high, uh, res high, high PPI resolution um, is what, uh, you know, bring, makes micro LED uh, very good. And Bernard Kress, uh, who used to be at uh, Microsoft, 
um, now I believe he is at Facebook. So he, uh, this is uh, his slide uh, recently he presented. So the, the reason he thinks that people like Applied Materials should work on this is Silicon CMOS uh, back plane area. So most of the displays that we look at day to day, they use uh, what we call TFT back planes. Whereas in the area of uh, AR VR devices, the um, uh, back planes that they will be using will be cost based because of the fine pitch and uh, functionality uh, that they need and uh, other sensing sensing elements that you will need to uh, incorporate into it. You know, and, and this very small dimensions obviously makes it ideal for Silicon CMOS. But there is only one company in the world that will be very happy when the display industry moves over to 300 millimeter wafers from the large glass substrate wafers that, that would be applied materials. It's simply moving our business people from one one building to the other. <laughs> so, so because we like to think of ourselves as both the uh, eyes and the brain, uh, because we do silicon CMOS for the logic and memory, and then the uh, display business for you know displays. Um, LED AP wafer, that's the um, sapphire substrate, which tends to be four to six inch range right now. There is a lot of uh, interest in moving that over to 12 inch silicon also. But growing um, gallium nitride on silicon is quite a bit of a challenge. Significant CTE match, significant uh, um, uh, other, other problems with respect to temperature and so on. Um, that makes it a little difficult, but there is some excitement there. Um, people are looking at various substrates and various processes in that area, and then uh, back-end process like uh, packaging and so on. So that makes it ideal for companies like Applied Materials to look at. Um, if you look at the approaches that um, that we are trying to, uh, uh, that the industry is trying to follow, um, to grow the three-color LEDs on uh, on these substrates, certainly there is interest to grow all three colors on the same wafer in the same uh, um, AP run. Um, we think this is about five to 10 years away still. I mean, I know we said this about five to 10 years ago, but we, it is still five to 10 years away. Um, and uh, we've been telling people that are excited about this to think about, uh, you know, the company that does AP deposition for a living, when they are saying it's five to 10 years away, you got to take it seriously because we don't see a business there. The reason this is challenging is um, the colors in the indium gallium nitride system come from the indium doping that goes into multi-quantum wells. So roughly about 15 to 20% range uh, for blue and 25% range of indium doping for green and pretty close to 35% indium doping in uh, uh, gallium nitride quantum wells for the red. Um, when you think about it, the uh, in the same AP wafer, if you have to control the doping levels within a layer at three fixed numbers, there is going to be an impossible task. And the incorporation of indium into these multi-quantum wells depends on the temperature, not the time that you spend. So, so that means on a single wafer, you need to control the temperature at which you are growing the multi-quantum well set. And that is going to be an impossible task to do. And so we think as exciting as that approach is, growing three color nanowires on the same substrate, it's a very difficult problem to solve. So the second approach, which is used in many people uh, right now, the significant issue here is the transfer of these dyes from the sapphire substrates onto the back planes. Um, so red, green, and blue, they are grown either on three different sapphire substrates or uh, blue and green are grown on sapphire and red on a different substrate, gallium arsenide substrate, and then you transfer them using uh, what we call uh, laser, LLO process or laser um, induced uh, transfer process, um, laser lift off uh, onto, the, onto the back plane. So uh, the first transfer is always easy. So getting that second die and third die transferred is proving out to be very difficult. So that is a big problem in that area. And in addition to that, the um, indium gallium nitride system for red has a very low efficiency. I'll show you some. Yeah. 
and then uh, alan gap aluminum indium gallium phosphide system that is traditionally used for red that also suffers from a very low red external quantum efficiency eqe for short i'm sorry there are a lot of acronyms in this presentation i didn't catch so um and the third area is using the blue LEDs, uh, single transfer onto the back plane, and then uh, using quantum dots to convert uh, the blue light into different wavelengths, uh, the higher wavelengths, green and red. The issue here is the blue photon leakage. The absorption of blue light into the quantum dots is somewhat limited. And so unabsorbed light kind of comes right through and filtering the blue light while allowing the red and green wavelengths to come through is a very difficult problem. Um, so that's the other uh, issue. So Applied along with a couple of other partners uh, has now trying to push a new approach. I mean, this is again, um, I'm going to describe a little bit into the end device rather than selling tools or processes uh, like we do. The reason for that is at a very early stage, at a stage where we are at, you know, if you think about the display business, the entire AR VR market represents less than one day of production for any display company. So it's, uh, that's one problem. Second problem is the entire AR VR business represents less than one week's worth of production for an Epifab. So it's very really hard to get them excited. So as much as, you know, so the uh, Gallium nitride LEDs uh, go into the rooms and the nation. They are such a high volume business for them. So you go to them and you say, I want six wafers and, and I'll come back in six months or a year. So they're not going to be excited about it anyway. So they're not putting in the right R&D investment. So we ended up having to do a lot of AP investments and a lot of, uh, you know, back plane investment and so on. So I'm going to describe our work as somebody who is making the end devices here, but because that's the reality of it. So what we started to look at is uh, taking non-visible wavelength LED dyes, UV range, um, 385 nanometers or so, which can be made on the blue um, uh, AP reactors, and transferring all those dyes in a single step, and then uh, putting down quantum dots to convert that UV wavelength into all three primary colors. So the Achilles heel for this approach till about last year or a year before uh, was that the blue uh, quantum dots were not available. So we worked with a chemistry company and we helped them develop uh, under a, uh, you know, uh, productive relationship, the blue quantum dots um, through up Applied Ventures investment. Uh, so we, our, our venture investment arm. So because of that commercial viability of the blue uh, wavelength quantum dots, we are now able to make these displays. These are the two displays our team made last year, um, a Fitbit size display, which is shown on the top, and then a smartwatch, smaller watch, smartwatch size display. Um, again, our micro LED dye approach is scalable to about three micron size, um, which may not be still uh, enough. Uh, I'll show you why. Um, and it has a external quantum efficiency of 25%. Um, and uh, we use a pretty interesting backplane design. It has four subpixels as opposed to three subpixels uh, for the simple reason that repair is a big expense. So in order to remove a non-functioning die and replace it, and while protecting the electrical contacts is a big significant issue. And by the way, most of us uh, that are shopping around, maybe this will make you a little bit more sensitive towards uh, not taking the, um, um, you know, uh, displays or TVs with the one or two defects home. So <laughs> um, the, the display business, 99.99% isn't good enough. So you have to get that five nines to six nine uh, functioning uh, subpixels. So that is a significant issue. And so uh, getting to that level of uh, yield and throughput at the, at, the, at the throughput required for cost reasons is a big, huge issue. So looking at the dye bonding and mass transfer steps, having that extra dye sitting there that can be used for a repair instead of eliminating or removing the non-functioning dye becomes an interesting um, 
you know, value proposition. So anyway, color conversion through very high absorption. So the, re, uh, the key performance advantage we demonstrated is uh, um, light emission pattern. We can control the light emission pattern in this uh, approach that we have, very high viewing angles, and a very good um, uh, current efficiency. So compared to the other approaches that I described, whether it is blue LEDs with uh, red and green quantum dots, or three micro LED dyes directly placed, it's interesting that we do better in this approach than the three red, green, blue direct LED emissions for the simple reason the red LED emission external quantum efficiency is very low. So, and red is typically about 30% in this white light uh, combination. So you do want that to be high. Um, so that's the key uh, benefits we demonstrated on the performance side and the cost side. We were able to do the um, uh, dye transfer in a single step, you know, so that's why the UV is always shown as purple <laughs> in these slides. Um, and the, uh, I'm sorry, now our program name is left on some of these slides. Rainbow is the name of this program, for internal program. Um, so um, the purple, uh, purple color top row shows that the UV LED dyes are uh, um, transferred in a single step, whereas red, green, and blue need to be transferred in three steps. And as I pointed out earlier, doing the first transfer is always the easiest thing because you know you have the contact, you have the source dies, and you can align it and place it. Once you have the first die, um, you have to now play with the Z dimension too because you can't crush the dies that are already there. So you got to make these dies of different heights and so on. And so that makes it really challenging for transferring the second and third. So that's why we hit the four nine yields or five nine yields pretty easily in our approach. Um, the repair strategy is much simplified in our level because we get the color conversion in a, in a, in a printer, high resolution printer that we developed for other purposes that we deployed here. And so if any subpixel is not functioning, we simply disconnect it through a software interface and then go back and print that particular color into the spare subpixel. So therefore, the subpixel approach is good. Anyway, so looking at these approaches, uh, I'll skip that slide. Looking at these approaches, we do think that we can use this technology to scale all the way from ARVR to large LCD, uh, large uh, displays that are you know, immersive TVs. Um, so if you have, if anybody had an opportunity to look at uh, uh, the Samsung protocol, Samsung Wall, you know, it is a, it is a, an immersive experience actually to stand in front of that TV and look at it. So these are very, <clears throat> very well made, uh, very high bright and very high contrast to displays. So um, auto displays, uh, there is a lot of traction for these in automotive displays because of the outdoor usage and brightness requirement. And uh, simply put, um, LCD and OLED have some <coughs> issues related to, <coughs> I'm sorry, issues related to um, um, temperature usage in the car, in a vehicle. So, um, you know, when the temperature is too low or too high, wallet tends to um, have some functional issues, wallet displays. Um, so, <clears throat> so it, <clears throat> I'm sorry, just to focus on the AR, VR uh, applications, the emerging applications, what we think are the key enablers and cost is not a big issue in this area. Um, very high brightness, very high resolution, and, um, uh, and multicolor and high energy efficiency. So if we look at those three um, uh, approaches, there's, uh, in spite of the fact that there are few that I showed that are coming out, um, <clears throat> there is not a single product that can hit all three requirements at this point. So, <clears throat> so we are gonna get some water, I'm sorry. I have some here. <clears throat> there are high resolution and full color and high brightness. All three are key requirements in this area. And the um, uh, sweet spot is right in the middle when you can hit all three of them. 
So um, the, way, the way I listed these product names on the slide is <clears throat> ones that can give either one or two of these. None of them actually give all three. But the reason for the high brightness requirement is um, <clears throat> if you look at the contrast ratio that you need for usage outside, you need at least three to one. And um, the brightness requirement is driven by the optics efficiency. And if you look at the contrast requirement and the um, uh, optics efficiency combination, if you assume that the optics are 10%, you definitely don't need the million brightness. Um, but um, at a 1% range, um, which is typical, I mean, what's listed here is 0.1%. That's the general optical elements, uh, glass lenses-based optical elements. But, um, you know, they require even worse, 12 million nits. But, you know, we need at least a million nits in these areas. And if you look at the uh, resolution requirement and uh, why that is challenging, it's a simple geometry. If you look at a single color, this is the reason why most of the um, displays that are out there that have uh, high resolution wearable devices, they tend to be of single color simply because every subpixel is a pixel. So uh, you can use uh, pretty high um, uh, large size micro LEDs or optical um, or OLED uh, materials. Um, about five micron size will give you 5,000 PPI. Um, whereas if you go to the moment you go to uh, uh, full color, you need to fit in at least three, and in most cases four. And we show two red subpixels here because the red tends to be of very low efficiency. Um, and so your your die size or uh, emitter size now is half the size of a pixel. So in order to hit 5,000, now you got to deal with a 2.5 micron size subpixel. So that means your emitter has to be even smaller than that, two microns. So that's why I was saying at a 5,000 PPI, even the three micron die is too large. So you have to hit two, two microns. But certainly a lot of people are now beginning to say 3,000 to 5,000 PPI range is good enough. You might still see in some uh, screen, some screen door effect here and there, but for most practical purposes, um, 3,000 to 5,000 PPI is good enough for these. Uh, this is a busy slide, sorry about that. <laughs> um, uh, I'll go quickly again, looking at different approaches. We talked about uh, um, the, the second column, which is the uh, RGB native. And then there are a few companies that are looking at stacking these dice one on top of the other. Again, transmitting the light of particular wavelength through other layers that don't absorb it becomes an issue, you know, uh, though you can get some transmittance, but the loss of light will begin to add to reducing your external quantum efficiency even further. So that makes it challenging. Um, <clears throat> Jade Bird and uh, Mick Lady are the two companies that are doing something different. They take three uh, single color panels and then mix them up like a box. And then they have these lenses or mirrors in the middle that actually reflect the light and makes it a single thing. But uh, the unfortunate thing about this particular approach is, um, first of all, there's a lot of moving parts in there. And second, all three panels are on all the time. So, uh, which means that you got some energy efficiency issue. Your battery life is very limited and they're bulky. So, because you got to create this little box, uh, kaleidoscope kind of a box. Uh, and then the uh, color conversion blue, I talked about it. That's simply because, uh, um, you know, you have some blue light leakage issue. And then the UV and RGB quantum dots, that's our approach. And then there is a lot of excitement about um, electroluminescent quantum dots as opposed to photoluminescent quantum dots. Um, that is uh, their lifetime and should be very low. Right now, maybe it's about 10% of where they need to be. So an order magnitude improvement in the lifetime is uh, what is needed. And that's a science problem. So, so you got a basic material science problem there that people need to address. Um, the reason we chose uh, 385 nanometers or UV wavelength is look at 
absorbance of this wavelength into the quantum dark material, cinium phosphide based, these are all cadmium free systems that we are uh, talking about. Um, <clears throat> it's about three to five times the absorbance of the blue wavelength. So certainly you can either make your quantum dot, uh, quantity of quantum dots you put into each subpixels much smaller because you got so much more absorbance, or you can make your emitter to be less efficient. So you can afford to play a little bit of a games there because of the high uh, absorbance. And then if you look at what's coming out of these quantum dots, uh, photoluminous and quantum yield, um, it certainly is the same as uh, what it is for blue. So, so you're not losing anything on the uh, emission side. So the, uh, what we call PLQ high, protoluminous and quantum yield, uh, with self-absorption correction tend to be 90% for red and green. And um, I think we improved the blue up to 85% now. So it's, it's pretty high, so you don't have a whole lot of light loss. Um, so that's on the uh, selection of the quantum dots approach. But the reason we chose the 385 nanometers is among the three colors, if you look at uh, right-hand side top, uh, micro LED, EQE versus die size, as the die size is reduced, the external quantum efficiency goes down significantly. Um, I'll go into the reasons on why that happens in the next slide. But if you look at it, as certainly the highest efficiency uh, at small sizes. And red tends to be very low, as I pointed out, even compared to green and blue, they tend to be, uh, UV tends to be higher. So you start off with a higher emitting um, um, micro LED dye and highly absorbing quantum dots. And that's what gives you the uh, advantage in this approach. Um, the, uh, you know, as you, reduce the die size, your surface ratio to bulk ratio becomes very high. So any kind of defects that are causing the non-radiative recombination of uh, the carriers um, makes it challenging. So that's what, yield, that's what results in the loss of uh, your uh, internal quantum efficiency. And um, so uh, this is from uh, my ex-colleague uh, Fred Schubert's book, so, um, so the IQE is dictated at the um, uh, small sizes by defect-related non-radiative recombination. That's the dominant factor. So you need to be able to control that. Uh, and if you don't control that, you lose, you lose light. Um, uh, the second um, factor that one needs to worry about in these, uh, especially indium gallium nitride micro LED dyes is current density. So at very, very high current densities, like the um, LEDs used in the general illumination, so you have this efficiency droop that happens at a very high current density. And on the low current densities, which is the typical of what you will use in displays, so you will have the, uh, you know, uh, defect-related non-radiative recombination again, working against you to, uh, to reduce your EQE. So that needs to be improved also. So um, before we go into how do we improve that, looking at red in the in-GAN system, uh, again, you know, I showed you plots about where you can be 25% range for the uh, EQE of the UV LED dye. And this is 2.9 to 5, 3 to 5% range is certainly where you are. Um, so they tend to be fairly low. Um, so uh, in this approach, if you look at the uh, aluminum gallium indium phosphide uh, um, and gallium arsenide substrate approach, certainly the uh, EQEs do improve uh, to 8% range, um, but even there, they suffer significantly as you go down in the chip size or the die size. Chip size here is just basically die size. Uh, as you go down to very small dimensions, you have a uh, non-radiative recombinations again coming back and haunting you. So a uh, few of the uh, processes that we are working on with our semiconductor uh, technology group is uh, improving the chip process itself, uh, uh, optimizing the edge a process in such a way that you reduce the sidewall, improve the sidewall passivation, and you, um, you reduce the uh, defects. 
that are causing the non-radiative recombination and then uh, improve the current density by masking some parts of the multi-quantum wells in such a way that you increase the current density in the overall device so that you get to the sweet spot within the, um, within the current density and EQE range and then um, improving the AP process itself to be um, much better uh, MISA structures. Um, another couple of additional things that we do is um, having the low external quantum efficiency for the brightness and uh, pixelation and contrast reasons is one. And the second thing is the battery life itself. And within the battery life, uh, a lot of the times what people don't realize is having low EQE and running these devices a million nets is possible, but you got to do something with the heat. So every electron that's not converting into a photon is going into a phonon. Yeah, I only have one more slide after this. Yeah, every photon is going, that's not, every electron that's not converting into a photon is becoming a phonon, so you got heating happening. So you got to design every other sub-element that's going into the system um, as a, um, you know, uh, that can tolerate this level of temperatures. So EQE, having a very high EQE is important even for thermal reasons. And then the um, one of the uh, other things that we don't worry too much about in, a, in viewing a device at a handheld devices level is the viewing angle and uh, how the light is coming out. So that's another area that you need to worry about in the AR, VR devices, you know, to designing the light extraction. So um, we, we, in the approach that we have, we build what we call pixel isolation walls. Each sub-pixel is isolated through a litho process, through a isolation wall, um, scheme. And so that improves, uh, the rainbow here again refers to our approach, improves the um, uh, normalized angular profile of the uh, uh, light output. So anyway, so with that. Um, oh, <laughs> so, so that's um, light is extracted. Light extraction looks like those are, ray, that's a ray diagram where the rays are going. Yeah, so. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So the dye, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is not a pork. Actually, somebody is a quiz. You no. Know? <laughs> so what is driving the biggest share of computation? I'll just click through it. One of my guys uh, likes to use uh, these quizzes. So. <laughs> yeah, I know. So exactly, perfect environment. That's why I left it in there. Um, yeah, the biggest uh, infection we are worrying about in the uh, semiconductor side is the uh, the next wave of evolution of artificial intelligence and IoT, the data that's coming out of there. And flat optics, uh, we think is a big, huge growth area for us. You know, photons are manipulating photons is a big area of opportunity um, through small elements like uh, what I showed you and the optical layers that we can control refractor indexes and other things on. Um, the primary requirements for AR VR displays is full color, polychrome, um, high resolution, high brightness. So it's that sweet spot of the three circles that we need to hit. Um, the advantage is that we think we have in a, in a UV LED based um, quantum dot approach is the, uh, you start off with a very high EQE, uh, small dice, uh, very high absorbing wavelength for the quantum dots, um, highest current efficiency and a single step die transfer that reduces the cost. Yep, that's about it. So I'm here today and tomorrow. If you have any questions, I know I went through some of the materials very fast. So just feel free to talk to me. Yeah. Um, since we've got an online presence, uh, if you have some questions, let me walk back to you with the microphone so they'll be able to hear it. Um, with that, does anybody have any uh, questions for Nock? You talked about a printer that's printing individual LEDs. Can you just talk a little bit about what that entails? Yeah, so we um, so we place the dies into the backplane, and then we do this what we call pixel isolation process. 
So that creates a little tub for each subpixel. And then we actually use a inkjet based printer um, to go in and print each color uh, quantum dot formulations. So these are quantum dot formulations printed through a very high resolution inkjet printer. So we can hit um, on a single pass, we can hit 1200 uh, dot, dots per inch DPI. So uh, on a multi pass, we can improve from there. And one other innovation that I didn't talk about is since the die is already there, the formulation that has the quantum dots in it is a UV curable formulation. So what we do is we actually print the red color first into only the red subpixels, and then spillage and over uh, spill is not an issue for us because what we do is then we actually turn on the red subpixel. It cures only there. And then we go through a washing and drying process, and then we in the second color. So uh, we have what we call a self-aligned curing. So we print and do a self-aligned curing. So even if the resolution of the printer is not high, it's okay because we just wash off the uh, uncured material. It's a wet process, but it works. Thanks for the uh, interesting talk. You talked about um pixels as the modular component that's kind of the basis of micro led and i always find when you have modular components it's really important to think about where you draw the line what's modular what's the component what's not yeah are there other ways you think are interesting to draw the line in the sense that you could combine pixels with some transistors and then that hybrid thing becomes a modular component does that give you anything are there other ways you all think about this etc yeah, so um, there are a couple of uh, research entities. One, um, uh, Letty in France actually is working on this, what they call a smart pixel. So in, in that approach, what they are trying to do is actually take the uh, gallium nitride material and gallium nitride with, with the entire structure of the LED, transfer it onto the silicon. And obviously a lot of these things become easier if you can have gallium nitride on silicon. So then you do a silicon to silicon wafer bonding. So the uh, the right hand side of my silicon now has transistors on it, 300 millimeters. So left hand side has the gallium nitride. Now you have a single wafer to wafer uh, transfer. So then you take that, remove the top, silicon uh, that has a gallium nitride on it. Now you have a single wafer. Um, now you can go through the litho process, H process to define individual elements. So they call that the smart pixel. Now you take that and, and now what you need for the uh, back plane is a simple glass substrate with copper wiring on it because you're just carrying current only. So that's actually an interesting approach. I mean, I'm talking about this because they, they, it's published already and uh, patents are out and you can read about them. Um, the only disadvantage we have there is the gallium nitride that is grown on silicon, even at six inch silicon, is very defective. So the overall uh, quantum efficiency is very low and it heats up a lot of the materials that we use for contacts in the CMOS. So that's been the Achilles heel for them. But if we can address that issue and improve the gallium nitride epi process on silicon and can transition that to 12 inch, you actually can get to a much finer, um, you know, unit unit definition. It's it's called smart pixel. Smart pixel and lady is is there. Yeah, it's an interesting question to contemplate. Yeah. I believe there are some questions in the back. 